Uh, it's okay. I have an MBA. Because, uh, <laughs> you know, right. some things we have that in common is about how I do like to make money. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for the opportunity to testify today on the business of stereotypes and degrading images. My name is Lisa Fager Bediaco, and I am the president and co founder of Industry Ears. Industry Ears is a nonprofit, nonpartisan, independent organization which has focused on the impact media has on communities of color and children since 2003. My co founder, Paul Porter, and I have collectively more than 40 years of experience working in media and entertainment companies, including BET, Clear Channel Communications, uh, MS Communications, Discovery Communications. CBS Radio, Capital EMI Records, Def Jam Records, uh, and Radio One, to name a few. Using our insider's knowledge, we created Industry Ears and IndustryEars.com to address the myths and misconceptions about media and entertainment industry and how they operate. And more importantly, to develop effective means to combat the negative consequences of harmful media images uh, and messages on children, particularly children of color. The now infamous Imus incident is intriguing in that it has created strange bedfellows. It has unified both conservative and liberal media invoking hip hop, hip hop music as the veritable poster child of all that is wrong with society. This, popular, this is a popular argument made in the throes of Imus oft repeated nappy headed hoes comment. Uh, is language such, is, is such that language that, I'm sorry, is that such language pales in comparison to the content of most commercialized hip-hop music. The idea is that if radio stations and Viacom music channels can play the, the bitch, nigga, ho content of gangster rappers, then what is so bad about the IMIS content? Comment. If the black community apparently accepts such language from its own, then why get upset when Don IMIS says, says it? What appears to be more difficult to understand, especially to our friends in the news media, is there, is a, there exists a large cadre of individuals and organizations that rep represent communities of color that also are in an uproar when media permits content that is degrading to women and people of color. Not, note that, unlike conservative and liberal media hypes, our concern is not simplistically directed at the artists who produce such material. Our concern is also directed towards the record labels, radio stations, and music video channels i.e. the corporations that are profiting from and allowing such material to air. This is, a, this is the fact that often gets overlooked in mainstream media. Not all black people and not all lovers of hip-hop, like myself, endorse materialism, violence, and misogyny that categorize, um, that characterize commercial rap music. It is time to wake up and see the real issue. The media conglomerates are the gatekeepers of content and in essence control what opinions receive airtime. The deletion of the Fairness Doctrine and the passage of the 1996 Telecommunications Act helped to create incredibly big media corporations by eliminating the requirements that balance viewpoints um, be pre presented and by relaxing rules, placing limits on how much media a single corporation can own. Further, by repealing the tax certification program, which successfully, if temporarily, increased ownership of media outlets by people of color, we have ensured that these big media corporations do not represent the diversity of society. With the control of so much media concentrated in the hands of the very few, we are at the mercy of big media and rely on companies to serve in the best interest of the public while also serving their bottom line. And as might seem obvious, what best serves the public interest and what best serves the bottom line are not always the same. This is evidenced by the fact that CBS fired Imus only when corporate sponsors started to pull out. Commercial hip hop has flourished in this environment, giving public perception that what you see and what you hear on radio and TV has been set as a community standard. The Federal Communications Commission states that it is a federal violation to broadcast indecent or sexually explicit content between the hours of 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. However, songs that discuss explicit sexual situations, including oral sex, rape, casual sex, and gang sex, receive daily spins on radio stations and video channels that cater to the 12 to 17 demographic. Freedom of speech has been stunned by the industry conglomerates to mean the B word, the N word, and hoe. 
while censoring and eliminating hip-hop music that discusses Hurricane Katrina, the Iraqi War, the Gina Six, dangers of gun violence and drugs, and songs that have contained words like George Bush and Free Mamiya. In 2005, MTV and radio stations around the world, around the country, excuse me, self-regulated themselves to remove the words white man from the Kanye West hit song, All Fall Down. The lyrics demonstrated the far reach of capitalism by exclaiming, drug dealers by drug, drug dealers by Jordans, crackheads by crack, and a white man get paid from all of that. When, when asked uh, why they decided to dub white man from the lyrics, the response from MTV was, we did not want to offend anyone. Today, hip-hop is bombarded by the demeaning images of black male thug and the sleazy video vixen. Record labels and their executives choose to support and promote these images for airplay air solely as if these are the only images that represent black people. I understand that payola is out of the scope of the subcommittee. However, I think it is important to mention because it is a major contributor to how music receives radio and video airplay. The former Attorney General, Elliot Spitzer, now Governor of New York, made deals with four major record labels, totaling 30.1 million, as well as with two broadcasters, for another 6.25 million in a statewide payola investigation that also implicated many outside of the state of New York. Meanwhile, the FCC settled with a consent decree that stopped the federal investigation of payola and allowed broadcasters to avoid a finding of liability by this violation and entering into a settlement agreement costing them a measly combined total of $12.5 million. And then on top of that, they did not have to admit guilt. All over the country, you have identical playlists from station to station, no matter the radio format, and, it, and it's no coincidence. Payola, Payola is no longer the local DJ receiving a couple dollars under the table. It is now an organized corporate crime that supports the lack of balanced content and demeaning imagery with no consequences. A good example of records, radio, and corporate partnerships includes a song on Virgin Record label called Miss New Booty. And there is a, uh, a, a sheet under your copies of this picture, and this is what I'm referring to. This song performed by a white rapper was silly and tasteless. But the promotion by the record label and the partnership with Girls Gone Wild was truly offensive. A local Washington DJ on an urban radio station in Washington, D.C., at 5 p.m. promoted the tune by suggesting he likes to visit the MissNewBooty.com website to masturbate. The website created by Virgin Records asked girls to enter a contest for the best new booty. The girls were required to take photos of their butts and post them online. Each week, people would vote for the best booty of the week and the winner receiving a chance to be in the music video. It was obvious that girls under 17 were entering the contest. Some even listed their MySpace accounts, making it easy for the child predator. The Girls Gone Wild partner was listed on top of the website and linked and making it easy for preteens and others to access. I wrote an open letter to Virgin Records and, and Doreen Dupree at the time, who was president of um, Urban Music at Virgin, responded by saying it was all in fun and it wasn't about sex. Later that same month, Jermaine Dupree appeared in an article in Billboard magazine and stated that hip-hop was inspired by strip clubs. Go figure. It is important to note that African-American children listen and watch more radio and television than any other demographic. Although top 40 and hip-hop radio stations claim to target 18 to 34 demographics, as well as the MTV and BET stations, their largest audience share are the 12 to 17-year-old segment. Record companies, radio stations, and Viacom are aware of their audience, but have chosen to put the bottom line above the welfare of the audience. In the documentary Hip Hop Beyond Beats and Rhymes, a group of white teens are asked what they think about hip hop. They explain hip hop gives us a better insight into black culture and it's like um, and how it is to grow up in the ghetto, as if all black people had the same experience. Bakari Kitwan, a professor and author of several books dealing with hip-hop and politics, Ms. Said, Ms. Petty, I'm going to wrap it up. Please. I'm going to wrap it up. Well, I'm going to tell you what he said. He was doing research around his next book, and he asked a group of uh, white women if they were offended uh, by rappers using the term bitch to describe women, and they said no because they're only referring to black women. In sum, uh, I just want to say I'm sure the industry will struggle the notion 
that these actions that they've done had let or influence any behavior. And so I strongly suggest that a research study look at the direct impact of degrading and stereotypical images on children and adults. This study will help us understand the direct implications and back up the policy and regulations that need to be implemented and enforced. Thank you very much. Dr. Dio, please. Uh, around five minutes. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> Chairman Rush, thank you so much for inviting me here, and I'm very pleased that you're holding this hearing today about this important uh, subject. We Americans spend two-thirds of our waking lives consuming media. Be it television, movies, video games, or the Internet, media consumption is the number one waking activity of choice for U.S. Americans, commanding on average 3,700 hours of each citizen's time annually. The average American child devotes 45 hours plus per week of what we call screen time, which is combined television and other forms of media. Uh, this alone, uh, I think, merits us putting serious attention into looking at media education in our school system. It's what children do with their time. Since culture is our shared reality, created and sustained through common experience, American culture is now largely what is um, shaped and maintained by the mass media. Be it television, video games, or music, media creates meaning, it creates shared beliefs and values and even rules for behavior. They all tell us stories, project, project images, and communicate ideas. Since we are social creatures, it is natural for us to learn who we are, how we should act, feel, think, and believe through the stories of our common culture. We were not created to have social interactions on the media. We, t we treat our uh, interactions with the media like they were real life face-to-face -face interactions, and that's how we learn um, through that information. If we see a black person behaving a certain way in the media, we think, oh, this is, this is social information, this is real behavior. This creation of culture through popular media was sadly exemplified recently when radio personality Don Imus referred to a college women's basketball team as, quote, nappy-headed hoes, unquote. Sadder still, many responded that the racist and sexist language was acceptable because that type of language is used by minority members in rap music. Unfortunately, racist and sexist slurs influence real people. For example, sending the message to girls that this is how our society views you and causing issues with self-esteem and with identity. Now, over and over again, I've had the chance to talk with people about media and by and large, what I find is that people do not believe they are affected by media at all. Um, studies show this as well, a lot of research documents. People are not, do not believe that they are affected by the media. As an example, a recent study showed that the more violent video games you play, the less you think people are affected by playing violent video games. There's a lot of reasons for these different misperceptions about the media. I'll name a few here. First of all, we all have a natural tendency to not want to believe that our habits are harmful. We don't want to believe that our child playing a violent video game can have a negative influence. That would make us a bad parent or a bad person. Uh, we have a mistaken view of how media affects us. For example, we think media effects need to be immediate and very extreme. Uh, people say to me often, I play lots of violent video games and I haven't picked up a gun and gone out and shot someone. Well, that's not how media effects work. Um, media creates a culture, and for example, we're talking about rap lyrics today, that creates a culture where we understand women, black women particularly, in a certain way. It's not a matter of hear one lyric and go out and shoot someone or behave in extreme fashion. It's a cumulative effect. Also, um, we misunderstand that media are produced primarily to entertain us. They're produced primarily to make a profit, and the content follows. And finally, we have a tendency to, to believe that um, for an important event, it must have an important cause. So if someone is violent, it can't be caused by watching television or listening to a song. So there's lots of things that we don't understand about how the media works. And again, that just underlines the idea that we need a media education curriculum in our school so that kids can understand this. Research on music has demonstrated that exposure to violent rap videos increases adversarial sexual beliefs meaning that we view men and women as enemies in the sexual sphere. It also increases the acceptance of relationship violence. Additionally, violent music lyrics have been shown to increase aggression. The APA Task Force on the Sexualization of Girls just put out a report in 2007. It's an excellent piece of work, and we've included 
um, in the written record that report for you to look at. That report found that when girls are exposed to images in the media of women as sex objects, a variety of negative outcomes follow. Sexualization is linked to negative consequences for cognitive and emotional functioning, mental health, including eating disorders, low self-esteem and depression, physical health, and one's own sexual self-image also develops less healthy uh, than it would. To understand the psychology behind these issues, one must understand that aggression is in part motivated by a need for power, dominance, and coercion. For example, current research characterizes domestic violence as being motivated by the need to coerce and dominate. Theoretically, both sexism and racism in the media are examples of social influence. Degrading women and minorities through sexist and racist, racist language and imagery is a way to keep women and minorities, quote unquote, in their place. It creates a culture in which this is true. I have several research examples summarized in my written testimony, but I w wanted to tell you about one study I conducted recently with my colleagues, um, Michael Collins and Brian Brown. We exposed young people to either sexist stereotypes or to professional men and women. And then we had them read a story, a real life story, about a woman who experienced sexual harassment from her college professor. And then we asked them questions about this. And what we found was that the men who had been exposed to the sexist images uh, were less likely to say the event really was sexual harassment, to say it was serious and damaging, and to show empathy for the victim. They were more likely to blame the victim and choose less severe punishments for the perpetrator. Today we heard that if you don't like a piece of music or a television show, you can just turn it off, but you can't turn off your culture. This, this kind of imagery pervades the culture. Uh, in conclusion, we enjoy freedom of expression in this country, but no country can grant us freedom from consequences. My message today is that violence, hatred, racism, and sexism in the media do matter, and I would call for two things. One more research and more funding for research on this topic, and two, as I've said, um, to implement a curriculum in our schools which would be referred to as media literacy training, and uh, I, I can give more information on that if anyone is interested, but it's just a basic education about how the media work, and this helps young people cope with those images that they see in the media. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to testify.